present you with the first in a lecture series of adult education lectures. This one is uh, very um, apropos for the season that we're in, with coming up to the high holidays in two months, and uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, where we always talk about tshuva and tshuva and tshuva. So let's talk about tshuva now. Let's get a head start, because it's never too late. Uh, a little bit about our speaker tonight, and we'll open up to his book. It says, Rabbi Dover Pinson is a world-renowned Torah scholar, author, and beloved spiritual teacher, widely recognized as one of the world's foremost authorities on authentic Kabbalah and Jewish spirituality, travels extensively throughout the world, really for a fact, not home on many um, Shabbosim, lectures, and he teaches the deeper wisdom of Torah, translating the ancient wisdom into an accessible, transformative knowledge for today's modern day and age. In his travels and at home, he has reached out and inspired countless of people to inner transformation with his uh, uniquely compassionate and wise counsel. And Rav Pinson lives in Brownstone, Brooklyn, in Carroll Gardens, where he is the Rosh Hashiva, the Dean of the Ian Institute for Advanced Jewish Studies. There's a kolal, there's a classes every single day, there's a shul, there's fantastic groups, and there's so much going on there. And he and his wife, his sister, some of you might know, have done a tremendous job in the last 10 years building up uh, that area in Brooklyn. And we're very, very happy that he can be here today. But quickly before we start, I just want to give a quick introduction as to what we're going to be speaking about. We're in the period of mourning in the Jewish calendar, which is this, the largest period of communal mourning that we find ourselves in called the three weeks. And especially now, we're in the nine days. So the three weeks start from the 17th of Tammuz and go until the 9th of Av. And the nine days is from the first of Av until the ninth of Av. And this period of mourning is for the destruction of both temples that were destroyed on the ninth of Av. And one of the main reasons our sages teach us was the cause of the destruction is the sinat chinam, the senseless hatred towards fellow Jews, towards each other. And this is something which we will hear, um, usually hatred or non-love of another person comes from ego and a big part of tshuva is dealing with your ego so we're going to get into that i'm sure but there's a really uh, beautiful thing uh, beautiful saying by rebel Eliezer in the second chapter uh, tenth verse of ethics of the fathers in Pirkei Avot, he says repent or return one day before you die and the sages in the gemara ask the person doesn't know when he's going to die he can't, <coughs> doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work and the answer that's given in the Talmud and the Gemara is live your entire life in a state of repentance every single day of your life. Now that is a level we can all achieve and that is something we will try to discover today. Good evening everybody. So we want to talk a little bit about transformation and what does it mean to transform. And if there's a difference between a person changing, which change is always a complicated word because everyone is connected to their ego and to a certain perception about self. And people are resistant to change. No one wants to change. But we're going to try to understand that real, real change is not to change outer behavior. If you do one set of pattern of behavior, then you do another set of pattern of behavior. But real change is about genuine internal transformation. So you're not just changing the actions but you're changing the doer. So how do we change the doer? And I think what we're gonna do, because it's a very sophisticated crowd, we're gonna use four different paths, four different methods of understanding this. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to take the last thousand years <coughs> of Jewish thought from classic philosophy to classic Kabbalah to a more updated version of Kabbalah, which is Hasidut, the path of the Baal Shem Tov, and then a parallel to that, which would be the Musar movement. So I don't know if you're familiar with these, these four branches, but I'm going to explain you what they are. And we're going to see how these four unique approaches from classic philosophy, classic Kabbalah, Hasidut, and Musar will give us an understanding of how we actually can change. Now let me just lay out the problem. The problem that we have is, is a very simple problem. We all make resolutions. We all say that maybe it's the New Year, maybe it's Rosh Hashanah, maybe it's your birthday. You all say, okay, this year I'm going to, I'm resolving, I'm making a resolution to do X, Y, and Z. And let's assume a person is struggling with weight. We'll take something very mundane and try it. Let's say a person is struggling with weight or they're eating too much sugar or wheat. And it's not healthy for them. And you finally you reach your birthday and you say, you know, this year I'm going to cut out sugar. Did anyone ever say this? Or this year I'm going to diet, this year I'm going to do exercise. You say something that you're going to do. And when you say it, you really mean it. You're 100% convinced that when you made the resolution, it's an absolute resolution and this is what you're going to follow through. I'll give you another example. Let's say you have issues with anger. So you decide, and you've read books, and you went to a seminar, and everything's worked out, and you realize that anger is something that's destructive, and it's harmful for you, it doesn't help you, it doesn't help the situation, it creates strife, and you're not gonna become angry. You decide you're not gonna become angry today, and tomorrow you find yourself in a reaction that is anger. So it's not a premeditated choice that you're making. But something happens that triggers you to become angry. Or let's say you say, okay, I'm not going to eat sugar. And you're very serious about that. I'm not going to eat wheat, I'm not going to eat sugar, I'm swearing off this food. It's not healthy for me. And the first time you serve the food that is unhealthy, and you decide that you don't want to eat this, and it makes you headaches, and it's not good for you, you don't do it. But then you find yourself a day, two, three days later, you're eating the food that you shouldn't be eating. You're familiar with this phenomenon? I think we're all familiar with the phenomenon of making resolutions and not following through. And what happens is you make the resolution, you decide you're not going to do it, and then you do it, then you feel like a hypocrite. You say, I can't keep my resolution. I promised myself I'm not going to do this. And now I'm going back to doing the same thing, so I might as well just give up. And that's what happens. That's resolutions. This is why one of the biggest businesses in the world is gyms. Do you know this? Maybe you're not here. Canada, but in New York, I know this. Uh, I know a few friends of mine that own gyms. They do very well because the moment after New Year's, everyone makes a resolution they're going to the gym. They all sign up for the gym. They charge them, let's say, a few hundred dollars for the year, and the gym, within a month, is completely empty. So they can they have no problem. They overbook because no one comes. This is what happens. We make resolutions. We promise we're going to do this. We're going to be careful. We're going to do this. We're going to eat this, and we don't keep. We don't follow through. So what is really the root of this problem. Are we hypocrites? Is something wrong with our resolve? What is it? Why don't we follow through when we make our simple resolution? I'll give you a very simple answer. The simple answer is like this. It's not that we're hypocrites. It's not that we don't have good resolve. It's that the person that makes the decision to change to change patterns of behavior is not the same person that reacts. They're actually two separate people. I mean, obviously, they're not separate, but they're two separate people. We'll call them separate. We'll call one self is your rational left brain self, the person that assesses the situation and rationalizes and understands exactly what you should do, what you shouldn't do, and based on that, makes a, deci a decision, I'm not going to do this, or I'm going to do this. The person that reacts to life is not your rational self. 99% of the time, we're not reacting to life from a rational place. 
we give rationalizations to certain reactions that we have. I'll give you this a very interesting study. They had, um, they put a few people in a room and they had a doctor walking into the room checking the person, a few people in the room. And then a few moments later they released, the doctor left the room, they released laughing gas in the room. And two minutes later the doctor came back to check these people and all of them was, was laughing. Afterwards, they asked the people in the room, why are you laughing? And one said the doctor's tie was on a little crooked, one says his hair was sticking out, one said his pants were too short. Everyone gave a rational reason why they were laughing. Was that the reason why they were laughing? They were laughing because it was laughing gas. But because we have to wrap our minds around why we're doing some crazy things, we give rationalization. So the truth is that most of our behavior, 99.9% of our behavior, is reaction. Who is the one that's reacting is not necessarily the rational self. The rational self makes a decision to do something, and the reactive emotions or the reactive instincts acts contrary. So it's not that you're a hypocrite. It's not that rationally you think one thing and then rationally you think the other thing. It's two separate selves almost. We'll call it your conscious self and your subconscious self. Right? These are two selves. So really, when we think about trying to change, if you want to change a certain pattern of behavior, let's say you feel like you're struggling with anger, or you're struggling with your weight, or you're struggling to put on filling, whatever the issue is that you're dealing with, because every issue is the same. If you want to change your patterns of behavior, just rationally telling yourself this is the proper behavior to do will not help. If you go to a lecture, if you're struggling with anger, and you go to a seminar that the, the, the teacher is going to explain you the terrible nature of what it is to become angry, you're still going to be an angry person. Why? Because information that's left in the left part of the brain, in the conscious part of the brain, is not transformational. It's knowledge. We know it. I know what I should do. Everyone knows what they should do. Everyone knows exactly the way their life should be lived. But they don't live it this way. They don't live it this way because there's something in them that's forcing them to react a certain way that's contrary to the way they think rationally. So the real question is, first of all, who is that subconscious and how is it created? And the, real, the deeper question is, once we know who this subconscious is, how do we recreate it? If I want to have positive reactive behavior, how do I change the internal self in such a way, in such a powerful way, that my reactions will be consistent to my beliefs or to what I rationally understand to be true? I want this in my life. This is what I rationally understand to be appropriate for me in my life. And I want my reactions to be consistent with this principle. How do we do this? That's problem number one and the issue that we have to deal with. The second issue, which is going to be related to this first issue, is like this. Most people live from the outside in versus from the inside out. And I'll explain what that means very simply. From the ins outside in versus from the inside out. Very simply. Today was a nice sunny day. Yeah, it was a nice day. When you woke up in the morning, it was sunny, the sun was shining, did you feel good about the day? Yeah. You wake up in the morning, the sun is shining, you feel good. A few days ago, it was raining, and it was dark outside. You woke up in the morning, you didn't feel good? I'm assuming you didn't feel so well. So now the question is, who decided how your day is going to be? Did you decide how your day is going to be, or the weather? So it wasn't an inside-out decision. It wasn't, I'm deciding that today is going to be a good day. And therefore, whether it is raining or it's not raining, it's going to be a good day for me. But it's the weather, something that's external to me, that's affecting me, how I'm going to feel. And this happens with every encounter. Let's say, for example, you're walking down the street, or let's say you're in a business, and you have people that you're dealing with on a constant basis, and someone walks over to you and says, by the way, I never realized you're, you're actually really brilliant. You have wonderful ideas mind is very creative and you're going to help us tremendously. 
Do you feel good about yourself? Yes. Most people do feel good about themselves when they get complimented. But the problem is that the flip side of that is that when someone walks over to you, and by the way, it says, you know, I didn't realize you're actually an idiot. You don't feel so good about yourself. So who decides how you're going to feel about yourself? Are you making the decision or somebody else is making the decision? And is it the weather? Is it other people? There's a very sweet story that is written by one of the students of Nachmanides, of the Ramban, Yitzhak Nginako. <coughs> he was this great Kabbalist, and um, he repeats a story that there was once a student that came to a great teacher, and, he's, and he told the teacher he wants to become a student, he wants to become his pupil. So the student you know, goes to an exam, and everything is perfect. He says that you're, you're, you're a tremendous scholar, and you know, master in the Talmud and the Tzar, you, you're really, you're up to par and you can become my student. But I have to ask you one question. Have you reached the point of hishtavut? What is hishtavut? Hishtavut means shave. Shave is equal. Have you reached a point which it's translated as equanimity? So he says, what is equanimity? So he says, when they, someone praises you, you feel good about yourself? He says, sure. He says, when someone pokes fun at you. Do you feel bad about yourself? He said, sure. He said, I can't become your teacher. I want you to be equal. Praise and the opposite of praise should have the same effect on you. And once you reach that point, you can become my student. This is called Shaveh. It comes from a verse in the Torah, a verse in, in Psalms, that says, Shiviti Hashem Lenegdi Tamid, which literally means I've placed in front of me presence of Hashem at all times, the presence of God at all times, which is the way the code of Jewish law begins, that we have to imagine ourselves sitting in the presence of God at all times, the presence of the Creator. But the Kabbalists read the word Shiviti, not only I've put place present in front of me, but Shiviti means comes from the word Shave, everything's equal. Later on, the great Hasidic master, the Baal Shem Tov, said that Shiviti, equanimity, is not only with regards to interpersonal interactions, but it has to do with everything in life. It should always be equal. We're gonna, we have to understand what this means. But it should always be equal. It says also with regards to foods. Do you like one food over another food? You say, this food tastes good, this tastes not so good. We all do that, right? You have some taste of food. You like this spice and not that spice. If you do that, then it's not equal. If you go back to the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Eden they're told you can eat from everything. Just don't eat from the tree of knowledge. You know what the depth of that statement means? You can eat from everything, just don't eat from something. The moment you eat something, not everything, that's idol worship. The moment I say I like this, or I want this, versus something else, it means I'm separating the something from the whole thing. And that's why the Garden of Eden, then eating from one thing, there is no garden there is no tree of knowledge and tree of life. There's no separate trees. It's all the same thing. Every, app, every tree has both tree of life and tree of knowledge. Tree of unity and tree of duality. They're told, eat from the tree of life or participate in the tree of life. Do not eat from the tree of duality. The moment you eat from one thing over the other thing, that's the moment you enter into the world of duality. There's a funny story that I once witnessed you ever go to a bris? You know what a bris is? Circumcision for a little baby. So usually these are done very early in the morning. Because people work and you want to do it in the morning. The Talmud says it's a mitzvah in the morning. So you do this in the morning. Let's assume it's 6.30 in the morning. I don't know if that's early here if I go over. But let's say 6 o'clock in the morning. So I was once at a bris, 6 a.m. Now the custom also of a bris is to serve meat. Now, most people don't eat meat at 6 a.m., right? It's not so common. So, but you have to serve meat because it's like an important meal. So people usually serve salami. And that's like a double no. No one eats salami at 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Anyways, I was sitting at the place at 6 a.m., and this elder Hasidic Jew walks in. His name is Chaim Tashkenta. And he sits down next to me, and he's all jolly as if it's like 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And he's smiling and dancing at 6 a.m. Half the people are, are still sleeping, you know. And uh, 
he sits down next to me and it's a bris. So, so he, he's making a plate to eat. So most people take a little piece of cake, maybe some coffee. So he, he looks at the table from right to left. And it's like a family style buffet, so everything's on the table. So the first thing to the right, where his arm reaches, is a piece of sponge cake. So he puts a sponge cake on top of his plate. Next to the sponge cake, there was some ketchup for the mustard, for the salami. So he put the ketchup on top of the sponge cake. Next to it was a pickle. And then there was a piece of salami. And then there was a piece of herring. And then there was some other, uh, you know, maybe some chocolate. And he made a big blessing with a great smile. And he ate it. And I nearly threw up. <laughs> and I asked him, what are you doing? And he looked at me like I fell off the wall. What are you, what am I doing? I'm eating. I said, but this is, this is not, uh, what's the difference to this? Ah, the same time. That's shivisi. That's, that's completely equal. <laughs> I'm not saying you're going to reach that high level. But the, <laughs> but the point is, we have to realize that what we really want to achieve is some type of level of mastery, some type of level of control of our life. And if you want to have control over your life, and you want to feel like that you have some, some type of mastery, that you're not just dangling on the wind, that you know someone says one thing and you feel good about yourself, and someone says uh, another thing and you feel bad about yourself, and the weather is nice and you feel good, and the weather is not nice, and if you ate a good meal, if you had your coffee in the morning, you feel good, you don't have your coffee, we're kind of a little bit pathetic, if you really think about it. I, I'm, I'm, I didn't have my perfect night's sleep, so therefore I'm groggy, and people have an excuse. The reason why I'm nasty today is because I didn't have my coffee in the morning and I didn't have a night's sleep. But you're completely dependent on everything external, besides the one thing that's the most important thing, which is you. And you can make the decision exactly how and how you're going to interact and what you're going to be. So we have to, we're trying to gain some type of hegemony, some type of control of our life. And to learn to live from the inside out. And to do that, we have to start being able to not only transform ourselves on the external level of self, which is our action, but somehow to transform the doer, our consciousness, to change ourselves internally that we are in control and our reactions, our behaviors, and our thoughts, our feelings, and our emotions are all consistent to what we understand and believe is true. So how do we do this? This deeper self, which we'll call the subconscious, or the right part of the brain, whatever you want to call this part of the self, is basically a composite of all the impressions that we are up until this present moment. You have a thought, a feeling, an encounter, everything's being imprinted on the subconscious. So when it comes to a situation, let's say we're talking about eating sweets, and you're, let's say, 50 years old and you realize this is not good for you, and you say, I'm not going to eat it. But then a piece of cake is presented in front of you, and before you know it, you have yourself stuffing the, stuffing the cake. Why? Because this piece of cake triggers something within you. Maybe it's a memory. It's not a conscious memory. But maybe it's a memory of yourself three years old and having a birthday party. Or maybe it's a memory of yourself getting a piece of cake when you're a little kid being, being given a, a, a gift or being filmed special. There's something that's, there's a relationship, there's something deeper going on, and it's not just the external thing. It's something internal. So what we have to do is we have to reset our subconscious, reprogram it. To reprogram our subconscious that our instincts become consistent with our beliefs. That our, that our instincts become consistent with what we want for ourselves. How do we do this? So we'll give you, we'll give you these four paths. In classic philosophy, when I say classic, we'll say from the 9th century till, let's say, the 1400s, 1500s, all the great Jewish philosophers lived that period of time. There's a statement that keeps on repeating, repeating itself, that repeats itself often. And we're going we're to take this phrase. One is, Hergel nasa teva sheni. 
Hegel means habit becomes second nature. That's one statement. Habit becomes second nature. So we're talking about nature, and it's becoming a second nature. So the nature is the natural way that we instinctively react. So habit becomes second nature. That's one statement. Another statement is after actions, the heart follows. The heart follows action, which is counterintuitive because we would assume that the way it works, and this is the way it really should work, but that's when we assume it should work this way. We assume that we have a thought. That thought triggers an emotion, and that emotion arouses us to do a particular action. So the movement is from the head to the heart to the action. Right? This is the way we assume the movement works. It's just like the position of the body almost. Or the moch is the mind, the lev is the heart, and the covet is the digestive system, which is, which is the release. So you would imagine that you have a thought, then you have a feeling, then you have an action. But here we're saying that actually it's reverse. That the, the, the heart, which in Biblical Hebrew, heart does not necessarily mean emotion. It means actually a way of intelligence. The heart follows the action. So what this means is like this. If you have a certain pattern of behavior, let's say when someone insults you, I'm not saying people should insult you, but if someone does insult you, what's your natural instinctive reaction? If your instinctive reaction is the same reaction that you had when you were a two-year-old child, which was maybe to bite his finger, maybe today it's not to bite his finger, now it's, you became a little more sophisticated. So when you were 10 years old, you punched him in the face, and now that you're 50 years old, you try to hurt him, but not in such a, in a more subtle way, but it's the same reaction. You just become com completely in the defensive, and this is what you do. Action, reaction. Now you're 50, so it's a little bit different, but it's the same thing. If your reaction to a certain behavior is negative, what the early philosophers say is what you have to do is you have to create a new set of behavioral responses. Repetitive behavior becomes second nature. If this is going to become your repetitive behavior, which means first time, and you decide, every time I feel anger, I am going to run around the block. Every time I feel anger, I'm going to take a jog. I don't know, whatever it is, you can do whatever you want, it's not even important. Every time I become, I become angry, I'm going to write a letter to vet. Whatever it is, but it's not harmful to anybody else. If you set up, and who's doing this? This is your rational self, right? Your rational self says, now I'm going to set a new set standard of behavior. When I feel this emotion coming up, this is going to be my reaction. Now the first time, it could be pre premeditated, because you feel the emotion, you say, okay, I'm, feel, I'm starting to feel angry, okay, I'm gonna go take a job. The second time, it's not gonna work that way, because it's gonna feel angry, you're gonna be angry. Okay, so you have to start slowly becoming aware of what is your reaction, and slowly introduce a new response. By re repeatedly, continuously repeating the exact same response, that will come your natural response to that type of predicament. In other words, you're not, you're working from the most external aspect of yourself, which is the behavior, your actual response, the physical response that you have. And you're taking this response and you're making it into your new nature. How? Through repetition. We're going to see soon how repetition can work in terms of sound, in terms of sight, in terms of visuals and, and music. But this we're talking about just in behavior level. You're taking the behavior, you're continuously doing it. It doesn't end there. It's not just that you're setting yourself a new response behavior by this repetition of behavior. What you're really doing is you're actually transforming yourself because the heart follows the action. Let me give you an example. If you're not feeling sympathy for somebody else, let's say you're walking down the street, I don't know if you have this in Vancouver, there's a, there's a beggar standing on the street, right? 
and most days you say, you know, I'm feeling it, I feel, I feel pity, I feel, I'm sympathetic to this person's blind, I would like to give this person charity. Right, so it's coming from the heart, you feel an expansiveness, and you say, okay, therefore I want to help this person, and you give this person some charity. And one day you're not feeling it. What do you do? Or you're not feeling it in general. You know that someone tells you, don't you have a little Rahmanas some pity for these people, these poor people? And you say, actually I don't. I really don't. I want to be honest with them. I actually don't really care. Right? What do you do if, what do you do if you're that person that doesn't really care? 